Okay, well, my name is Dave O'Gorman, and I guess if I could talk to my college age self, I guess it would be, I would tell my college age self that he ought to just not worry so much about long-term situations, and he ought to enjoy the moment and be more present, because when you stop making plans is when really amazing things can happen. Sure, I'll fuck you, my friend Rachel said but only if you shave your beard. This was January of our senior year at Sleepy Little Clarkson University in Sleepy Little Potsdam, New York. I was a blotchy, loud-mouthed economics major. She was a long, creamy-skinned ideologue with a Toni Morrison collection and a ROTC scholarship. I asked if I'd heard her right. Now or never, babe, she said, handing me my electric razor. Got places to be. For four years, I'd been making peace with the realization that Rachel Tifford would not then, not ever, liberate me from my pants. To begin with, there was the small detail that Rachel was gay. She told me in our freshman year on what I thought was a date. Things had been going pretty well. She'd laughed at a bad joke, touched my hand at dinner. On our way home, I even remembered to open the door for her. We parked in front of her dorm. I leaned in a little. And then Rachel told me the truth, delivered in a festive blurt, like coiled plastic snakes from a can. Dude, I'm into girls. Sure, I could have driven away in a huff. I could have chosen the bachelor's degree in pouting. But I was hardly fitting in with the engineering school company of anyone else. Besides, it was Rachel who swung her foot in time to my boring stories. And so what followed was my four-year run in a bad Neil Simon play entitled Rachel's Friendship, my consolation prize. We spent every moment together, bouncing without warning from heated arguments on gender politics to moments so personal that bystanders couldn't bear to look. Hold still, she told me once on a crowded bench. You've got a booger. <laughs> At the end of our junior year, I volunteered to drive Rachel home to Albany. It's a four-hour trip, long enough to work out that I wouldn't see her again for three months. At a gas station in Lake Placid, I looked across the highway and saw an old-fashioned motel, the kind with the flashing arrow sign missing half its letters. I said, why don't we stop a few hours? And Rachel, tossing out the fifth cigarette I'd asked her not to smoke, said, why would we want to do that? We rode the rest of the way in silence. For me, the Albany trip ushered in a summer of indiscriminate debauchery. Rejection didn't matter anymore, and once it didn't matter, it also ceased to happen. The divorced mother of two, the niece of the longtime family friends, the prostitute in Montreal. <laughs> the guy I'd met while still a freshman and whose initial come on had left me queasy and exhilarated at the same time. I did them all. The thing about summers is they end. Chilly weather reasserts itself before you're ready, especially that far north. And in no time, I was drifting back into my old routines of test anxiety and masturbation. Except for one important difference. I never called Rachel Tifford. For one entire semester, I didn't dial the number I knew would still be hers didn't go to Maxfield's. When I passed her in a hallway, I nodded, but did not say hello. Just after Martin Luther King Day, as the St. Lawrence Valley thawed to slush, I rounded the last corner of my evening walk home and saw lights glowing from the corner window of my apartment. Don't ask me how, but I knew it was her. Don't ask me where, but a small and not quite dead thing inside me stirred. Don't ask me why,
but at that very moment, I threw my books into the snow and ran. By the time I reached the stairs, my hands were shaking. After half an hour of unusually stilted chit-chat, she handed me the razor. Two seconds after that, I was in my bathroom, shaving away rejection and displaced hedonism and my awareness of the truth, right along with the whiskers. So here is what happens then when the woman with whom you've imagined having everything, a life, a house, a daughter, finally agrees to do with you that one and only thing that you have wanted. There is fascination, an awkward moment. There is the vague potpourri of camel lights. There are secrets to reveal. You feel the way you imagine it would feel to stand before your maker in that gray lit tunnel, somber, grateful, and above all, terrified. And then, then it happens. You are as if a bystander enfolded with her, wrapped in the security of this that you have wanted, not something to hide or be ashamed of, but the right thing all along. You move together. You hang on. You hear a noise as if the frat boys playing football in the next yard have gotten into a fight. And you realize in a detached, almost anthropological way that it is the sound of your own voice screaming. At least that's how it happened to me. Five minutes later, Rachel was pulling herself back into her pants and lighting up. Thought you deserved that after all you've been through, dude. I looked at her and blinked. Come on, babe, she continued. I know it's been hard for you. I get it. Besides, a little mercy fuck once in a while never hurt anybody. <laughs> oh my god, I said, hoping that in the dark she couldn't see my face. Rachel, I can't believe you just said that. She put on her sweater. Over the previous year, I'd had more sex with more people than I'd expected to have in my entire lifetime. And now this had happened. Rachel, I said, I love you. What I mean is, I, I've never made love before. And Rachel Tifford blew a long exhale of smoke and patted me on my knee. Dude, she said, turning for the door, you'd think I couldn't tell?